Hi, this is Nurse Annette, and we're going to focus on medical surgical nursing. This is Unit 1, covering Chapters 1 and 70 in our textbook, and Part 1 of the first unit. We're looking at the roles of the medical surgical nurse and the emergency room nurse. Chapter 1 focuses on foundations for medical surgical nursing. Med-surg nursing has evolved dramatically uh, within the last 10 to 20 years, and it's no longer seen as a stepping stone towards a different profession. It is an actual well-respected, um, sought-after uh, branch of nursing. The medical surgical nurse manages very acutely ill adult patients and practices in a very holistic interdisciplinary um, kind of method. The number of practice settings is growing with the changes in the healthcare industry. And really medical surgical nursing is the foundation for all nursing practice that you will do in your career. Med surge nurses make up the largest group of practicing nurse professionals. The medical surgical nurse needs to be competent in a variety of skills, and that includes communication, empathy, caring, and compassion. They also have to be skilled scientifically in terms of the nursing process, clinical decision making, and evidence based care. On the floor, they practice patient centered care. They focus on quality, safety, and interprofessional practice. Some of the changes that we've seen recently have included the increased focus on patient safety and quality of care. And these have come from measures such as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the foundation of, uh, or the creation of CUSIN, the Joint Commission and the National Patient Safety Goals the HCAPs, which are the customer survey scores, and the Institute of Medicine reports. Patient safety outcomes include um, the QSIN competencies, such as providing patient-centered care, teamwork and collaboration, practicing based on evidence, so evidence-based practice and evidence-based guidelines, quality improvement measures, safety, and informatics. The national patient safety goals include identifying the patient using at least two different sources. Currently, we always ask name and date of birth, but things like social security number, um, you know, those would be acceptable as well. You wouldn't want to ask the patient something like, what's your address or what's your phone number or um, information that could be common to other people. Improve staff communication, and we've been using bedside reporting for handoff and SBAR communication tools. Using medication safely, and we've developed a lot of different checks, the 10 rights of medication administration, and then in addition to that, making sure that um, medication preparation areas are quiet and uh, safe, and you know the PIXIS machines themselves, ele electronic medication uh, administration, pre-hospital medication lists and uh, medication reconciliation. You know, we're really focusing on medication safely and decreasing the amount of harm that reaches the patient. The safe use of alarms, infection prevention measures, injury prevention measures, and then minimizing the risk for errors and adverse events. All of these are incredibly important to maintaining patient safety and health and best outcome. At the bedside and on the phone, face-to-face, -face, wherever you are, if you can really um, kind of focus or create your communication in a way that it's going to be organized and outlined well, um, especially using this SBAR tool, you're going to enhance your uh, communication skills with other providers as well as increase the likelihood that you'll get what you're asking for. So it makes you a better advocate. In SBAR, we start with the situation, which is uh, basically the chief complaint or the current problem with the patient. Then we provide some details on the background, so some information about the patient, um, and then our assessment, so what do we think is wrong with the patient, and then a recommendation, and so that's what you're asking for.
the nurse in the professional practice is ethically and kind of professionally bound to participate in QI. If you see something that isn't going well, you should um, take the steps to uh, involve yourself in research, not to pass the buck and say, hey, somebody else should look at this, but to actually say, I wonder what would happen if. So the first step of that is always developing that question as being, you know, kind of the curious cat and saying, boy, I wonder what would happen if. Um, so developing that, that PICO question or you know, I wonder what would it happen if we did this versus this or how would this change our outcomes. Um, so it always starts with a question and then you're researching, you're evaluating evidence, um, you kind of plan it and integrate the evidence into practice. You evaluate whether or not that um, change you know, had an impact on your practice. And then if it did, you want to disseminate the evidence uh, to other people to either encourage them or dissuade them from following what you did. There have been some consumer-driven changes as well, things like Condition H, where the family or the patient or their advocate can call for help if they feel like they're not being listened to. Hospital administration, the lead physician and the charge nurse respond to the patient room to evaluate the situation. This helps prevent any um, unintentional errors of omission by not recognizing clinical decompensation um, you know, before it happens. The nurse can also call for what's we, what we refer to as a rapid response team, and that's an interdisciplinary response when the patient has clinical signs of deterioration that require immediate assessment and intervention. And examples of these would be things like hypotension, tachycardia, extreme shortness of breath, syncope, potential lethal arrhythmias, and chest pains with signs of distress or ST elevation MI. Now, essentially, anytime you want a physician at the bedside immediately to assess or intervene with the patient, you would call a rapid response prior to a cardiac arrest. Once the patient goes into respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest, you should call code. Chapter 70 focuses on the role of the RN in the emergency setting. Emergency nursing is geared towards the rapid assessment and treatment of medical and trauma patients of all ages. We know that um, there's a lot of vulnerable populations that we service and that um, patients who come in have a lot of risk factors um, kind of just following them through the door. So gender is a risk factor for trauma. Males are twice li as likely to be injured as females. Race and socioeconomic economic background also uh, contribute to risk factors. And we know that alcohol as well as other substance use plays a very important role in trauma because it mitigates our ability to make good decisions. Vulnerable populations, we did talk about this in class, but vulnerable populations would be anybody who has uh, limited access to care. Um, and this could be uh, financial, it could be transportation, it could be um, cognitive impairments, um, you know, it, it could be some um, whatever it is, <laughs> anybody. Uh, and, and really the take home is that while there are some people who are drastically and evidently vulnerable, every potential person who walks that door um, has the risk of being vulnerable. And whether it is, you know, one um, catastrophe away from having, you know, everything fall apart uh, or, you know, that has already happened and everything has fallen apart and the person is now transient and, you know, does not have access to food, water, uh, funding, health care, um, you know, safe shelter in the winter, things like that. You know, all of these people we would consider to be vulnerable or at, at risk. Um, to not receive adequate access to health care. The emergency care team is made up of um, a great and diverse group of people that include our uh, field or pre-hospital personnel. So that is our first responders, our EMTs, our advanced EMTs, and our paramedics. They use the same kind of triage system that we use in the hospital to determine how severely someone is ill or injured and the most appropriate facility to transport them to. Once you arrive in the hospital, we have hospital personnel. So we have physicians and PAs and NPs and nurses, respiratory therapists, 
uh, rad techs and radiologists. We have lab staff. Um, you know, we have uh, techs that work in the ER. Um, there's pharmacy, social work, uh, patient advocates, pastoral care, all these ancillary support staff. But the, the thing is, is that we're a team and everybody's working together to achieve the same uh, great outcomes for patients and families. Safety in the ED is a very serious concern. Emotions are high. For some people, this is the worst day of their lives. Some people are there against their will. They're brought in by police. Um, some people are there with mental health issues and in crisis. And all of those things combined can really escalate situations um, quickly. So some challenges are uh, patients and family and visiting um, people who are visiting because they can become emotionally overwhelmed and misplace their uh, anger and their fear towards the EM, uh, emergency department workers. Other safety concerns though, are that you know the ER is not a place where you have tabs alarms, rise alarms, bed alarms. Patients oftentimes get out of bed without anyone knowing. Um, it's very hard to use gate belts in the rapid turnover environment that we have. Um, so most patients are ambulated with just standby assist, which you know can be um, really scary if, if, you know, the person starts to go down. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, you know, a limited number of things like walkers and canes and um, uh, assistive devices for a large, you know, kind of rapidly changing population. So certainly things like slips and falls um, have a greater potential in the ED. And luckily they don't happen all that often because we try to be um, meticulous in our uh, kind of egress testing before we let people get up and, and walk, but um, definitely safety is a concern in terms of um, injury to uh, self and injury to the workers. The flow of um, the patients through the, the ER is kind of uh, pre-hospital care with destination determination, so they decide does this need to go to a local facility, does it need to go to a level one trauma, cardiac or stroke center, and then they transport them to the hospital. At the hospital, they get triaged and assessed, and then the interventions are done. The role of the triage nurse then is to determine who has the highest priority. And so when you think about it, the triage nurse is determining on this um, emergency severity index or ESI level, do they need a physician right upon arrival? So that would be like an ESI one, could they wait five to 20 minutes? That would be an ESI two. Could they wait hours but need a really full workup? That's an ESI three. Can they wait hours but need minimal care? That's a four. Or could they wait days and they don't really need any care but maybe just a visit and that's a five. Any threats that are found during the primary survey or any abnormal vital signs increase the uh, index of severity. So on primary survey, our main concern is airway and C-spine. We wanna make sure that we keep the airway open and then we protect the C-spine from injury. After that, then we would think about, um, you know, are they breathing, rate, depth, and effort? Is it adequate? Do they need oxygen or ventilation? And then uh, for circulation, you know, is there um, bleeding that needs to be controlled, IV access, fluids, vital signs, and then neuro, um, you know, what's their GCS, uh, pupils, are they moving all four extremities? Do they have good neural motor in their hands and their feet? And then expose and look for any other rashes, injuries, you know, ecchymosis, uh, anything else that's abnormal uh, with their, their skin or their body. But the um, patients who have the highest priority are people who have abnormal vital signs that would be indicative of things like shock or um, so tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, or patients who have complaints that could be a threat to life or limb. So someone who presents with, you know, chest pain, difficulty breathing, sweaty, uh, somebody who's actively seizing, uh, somebody's having like severe difficulty breathing and can't speak, or, you know, their O2 sat is really low. Um, things like that tend to be higher than somebody who just has abdominal pain, um, as long as they don't look like they're, you know, septic or hypotensive. There are different levels of specialty centers, as I kind of alluded to um, in terms of destination determination, but uh, hospitals can um, achieve accreditation as specialty 
designated centers for things like trauma, cardiac shock, stroke, burns, uh, and these are um, accrediting agencies that go around and make sure that they have um, the adequate amount of staff, testing capabilities, um, students volume, and um, your kind of a regional center 24-7. Uh, so a level one requires um, everything all the time. A level two is a little bit below that. And then most of our community hospitals are level three, so they can stabilize, perform some interventions, and then transfer the patient to a higher level of care if needed. The other thing that we really have to consider when we are doing triage is the mechanism of injury. So we really have to think about um, during the injury, what forces were applied to the body. So the mechanism of injury is talking about the transfer of energy from whatever the object was that struck somebody or the speed and the force of the car, how fast they were traveling when you struck, you know, a, a standing still object um, or, you know, if it's a gunshot wound or a, a knife stab wound, uh, things like that, um, the, the size and the velocity of penetrating trauma. So the mechanism of injury gives us an idea of um, the amount of force applied to the body, which gives us not only injury patterns, but also helps us predict the severity of the outcomes. And that helps us determine, um, you know, triage priority and severity. With uh, blunt trauma, the skin usually remains intact. And that's when you are struck with a blunt object like, you know, a baseball bat, or you fall down and you bump your knee against something or you're in a car accident and you hit a tree and the airbag goes off and it strikes you. Um, you know, all of these things are blunt trauma. Penetrating trauma is when you actually have um, something that goes through the skin. And so again, you know, a sharp object or a projectile would be penetrating trauma. And penetrating trauma and open fractures carry the added risk of infection and they need antibiotics for treatment. So that just makes them Kind of a, a higher severity if you have an open femur fracture that's a higher severity than you know a closed fracture um, only because the risk now of infection um, is so much higher because the skin is open so you know be thinking about um, that uh, patients with uh, closed fractures don't need antibiotics patients with open fractures do and oftentimes they need iv antibiotics um, so they may even have to be admitted with something like Complications of trauma um, include hemorrhage, which is the leading cause of preventable death after injury, which is why we've started this huge campaign for Stop the Bleed. Uh, so controlling bleeding is super critical. Airway compromise, potential causes like rib fractures, pain, patient positioning. Um, we talked about the importance of watching out for like a tension pneumothorax if the patient has any trauma to the rib cage or the chest. And uh, we talked about the signs and symptoms of that. So um, tachycardia, tachypnea, jugular vein distension, um, uh, uh, tracheal uh, deviation, which is seen very low down in the suprasternal notch. And then uh, in addition to that, um, the patient will have a narrowing pulse pressure and eventually um, hypotension and uh, severe hypoxia and the critical rescue for attention pneumothorax is needle chest decompression, and then eventually they'll get a chest tube. Patients with sepsis um, who are also trauma patients suffer kind of a, a, a two or double whammy where they have this um, severe complication of uh, infection on top of a critically injured trauma patient. And sepsis can occur from the treatment that we have to do to fix the trauma. So it can come from the IV catheters, the central lines, the Foley catheters, the ET tube, or even just the surgery to fix the trauma. So that's certainly a complication that can occur secondary to the treatment for the trauma. And then hypothermia, we talked about the fact that hypothermia um, in, is part of that trauma triad of death because coagulation becomes inhibited when those body temperatures drop and the patient is no longer able to clot and so they bleed to death uh, oftentimes internally and uh, die. All right, that's all I have for you. Um, hopefully that was a helpful review and uh, let me know if you need anything.